Welcome to Get Your Rocks Off with Mick Wall, the world's leading rock and metal writer. Each week, he'll unpack stories, stories that you won't find in print. So pour yourself a Jack and Coke and get ready to get your rocks off. This episode is brought to you by the Getcha Store. For all of your Get Your Rocks Off merch, including t-shirts, face masks, and yep, Hotel Tropicana coffee mugs, head over to getyourstore.com. Hello millions of fans, welcome to the new episode of Get Your Rocks Off. Get Your Rocks Off. Um, my dear friend. Dear friend, close and, friend. And a number one years. fan of the show. <laughs> close personal friend of many years. Many years indeed. Far too many to count. Um, right, John, so... What should we do this week? Well, if you did, if you listened last week, you might have a small clue, because there was a, a moment of confusion in the introduction, which we'd like to apologise for. Now. Well, John is apologising. I'm apologising because it was his fault. Uh, I was very clear on what we were doing, as always, um, and assumed we were doing Journey, but we weren't, were we? Well, we were doing Iron Maiden, but now we're doing Journey. <laughs> now we're doing Journey. Now we're doing Journey, yes. Yeah, and, and Journey, of course... At my request, I must say. Well, that's because you are. I would pigeonhole you here as... Oh, thank what you. I liked, <laughs> what I liked... You and uh, my agent, Matthew, you're very similar age and very similar tastes very in young, musical stuff. Youthful, vibrant. Yeah. Yeah. And um Don't you're, be lumping you're both... me in with, with an agent. We no, no, you're, no, no. I, like. I, I get I get I sometimes think you are Matthew. I sometimes <laughs> I've think probably he's made John. you more money than Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> made me more money. Yeah. You've made me more yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. Oh, have you? By recommending your books in bookshops that I'm in. I always put them to the front. When I'm in the I do. When I'm in the bookshop, <laughs> I go to the music bit and I see the, the Metallica book and the Guns N' Roses. I put them at the front. There's my do do my mate a solid. Oh, okay. All and right. facing <laughs> outwards, not the spine, facing out. Cover showing. I thought that was Led just Zeppelin, my... the the umpteenth biography issue or whatever it's called. No, no, no. The anniversary. No, no. What, did, what did you call it? The anniversary the edition. 50th, or 50th the anniversary. The anniversary edition. An additional 40,000 words oh, if you don't nice. want so brand any, new interviews. Any of them about Led Zeppelin? I, I have a new did Led, you, Led you, Zeppelin you, book coming out soon, actually. Did you have those actually. lying around on the computer? <laughs> no, no, I have a, a new more forensic study of the Zeppelin story. Oh, do you? And it's called Led Zeppelin... The Forensic Study. No, it's called <laughs> Led Zeppelin, The Actuality. Oh, that's going to be good. See? That's going to uh, be good. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so when I'm in the bookshops, I put them facing outwards for you. Oh, that's very you kind go, yeah. of you. That must explain yeah. the surge the in surge sales, sales I've had recently. Yeah. <laughs> Our oh, bookshops have been closed. Um, right, so Journey. Now, as I was trying to say, until somebody interrupted me, most unusually, you and Matthew, I have you and Matthew confusion because you claim, you both claim to be Journey fans, but in the actuality, you are what I would call raised on radio fans. Oh, that's a very good thing. You mean the Which is not the real you, journey. You mean the single greatest AOR album ever recorded. Recorded by Neil and Steve from Journey yeah. with the band that went on to become Guns N' Roses with uh, Axel, and, for all I know. What was his Jonathan name? Randy, Jane? Randy... Andy Randy on bass. Right, sort of. Randy Jackson. Yeah. But who was the Jackson who isn't a member of the Jackson Five? That's right. That's right. But he should have done because he can play. Yeah, know. he can, yeah. Unlike, you know. Yeah, the others. So, so, so here's my point is I am a Journey fan from the real Journey days and you're kind of like this glory hunt yes, that yes, comes in yes. on Raised on Radio. The no, Journey no, no, album no, that real no. Journey fans have never the, even listened the, there to. There are only three Journey albums that are really, really <laughs> worth investing your life in. And they are Escape, 
Frontiers and Raised on Radio. The mm. great trilogy that comes in the middle of their career. The great trilogy. Yeah. Comes in the middle of the, I thought it was all over after Raised on Radio. Well, it was, well, I'm talking comparative distance. If you count from when they started to now. You're going to start talking about they, fucking balloons when they again. Are, well, they are when actually balloon, still... When balloon, you inflate balloons. They are balloons. actually still going. You remember, you remember when you were taken out to America to see them because they were still playing? If you do... You remember the band you saw in America... No. Do you remember them? No. <laughs> Was it Iron Maiden? <laughs> no, they were a bit... They're quieter than Iron Maiden. So Everyone's quieter yeah, than Iron... Yeah. Was it Metallica? Yeah, anyway. But let let me kick this off by saying... Yes, I want to start. I want to start in a slightly... Fucking kick it off somewhere. I want to start in a slightly different place because there I was at home, trolling through Amazon Prime as you do, looking for something to watch, and thrown up in my suggestions, who knows why, because see, I didn't even know it was on there, was a, a journey documentary. And I thought, oh, OK, well, I'll watch the opening for five minutes. It'll be terrible, obviously. But, uh, but I'll And it transpires. It's, it's not a mere journey documentary. It's the story of their finding and recruiting Arnel Pineda, mm. who is the current singer in Journey. And has been for a long while. Has been for a long while. So... Arnell comes from the Philippines and has this terrific origin story, which is told at the start of this programme, which is that Journey needed a singer after Steve Perry had left. They'd exhausted almost every avenue that they could conceivably find until Neil Sean is at home one night watching YouTube and turns to the camera and says, I was literally typing in Journey tribute bands. And I was watching Journey Tribute Band after Journey Tribute Band just to see if any of them had a singer that was any... Because Perry was essentially irreplaceable because his voice is, is unique, you know. I mean, Well, it, it was thought unique until thought, Arnell yeah, came yeah, along and, could were, do Steve well, better yeah, than Steve. Well, there were lots of Perry impersonators and Journey had had a go with Steve O'Gary, hadn't they, and people, you know, guys like that. There are lots of people who sound a bit like Steve Perry, but the, to... to comprehend the majesty of steve perry's voice <laughs> the majesty you know which was this extraordinary thing he was known as a duck they used to call him the duck because it, it escaped he had this incredibly high register and then that came down on frontiers he was more when they opens with the classic separate ways which plays a part in this documentary as well um, and has the great the single greatest music video of all time um, what, for separate ways? Yeah, have you, it's, it's, yeah, I've it's, seen, it's yeah. aped endlessly. People recreate it and uh, on very funny. But so Perry's voice sort of slightly deeper then, and then you come to Raised on Radio when it was in its fullest bloom, richest, its greatest majesty, like a good, like a good yeah. coffee. Girl can't help it if she needs love and all that. Yeah. Um, but I don't like anyway, that one. Back, back to this. So, so Sean is desperate to find a singer to replace Perry. He's, he's at the point where he's looking through YouTube. Mm. And not only is he looking through YouTube, he's now watching videos that aren't even in English. He gets to the Philippines and he finds this guy. He's, that was a find, long night, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was a long night. It was a <laughs> That's long a night. fucking long night. He gets to the Philippines and he has this guy playing in a band called, they're called something like Zoo. And they then show you the clip. They show you the YouTube clip of this guy, Arnel Panida, who's a tiny little... Yeah, Filipino guy, really, and it, he seems to be in some kind of restaurant. I mean, it's literally a restaurant. And the band start up and they do Faithfully, which is Perry's great ballad from uh, from the Frontiers album. It's about being on the road. It's about being away from your uh, family. It's, hang on, it's a song about being on the road. Yeah. Never heard that yeah. idea before. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Mr Cynic. <laughs> People hear, people hear Faithfully and they begin weeping <laughs> openly. Yeah, I, I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> because it's about, certainly because it, it's, it's stressing the musician's central position, which is when they're on the road, they are faithful to their wife and children. What? And that's what the song's about. What? That's what I'm forever yours. So what you're saying is, is faithfully. all these other bands, yeah. Slash... <laughs> bon Jovi, Vince Neil, Vince Neil—they're all completely. They faithful. got it wrong. No, they got it right. They, they, this is this is Perry's song for them. It's like we. I know you were. I know you were on the road. I know you were lonely. I know it was hard. It, the lyric. I know lyric, you were snorting Krell off a hooker's <laughs> ass. <laughs> Being apart ain't easy on this love affair. 
I was snorting Krell off a hooker's ass last night. <laughs> That's how the song goes. Because I was lonely. Because I was lonely. I was lonely. I was on the road, yeah. which, as everybody knows, yeah. is no fun I'm at all. forever yours. Where is the fun in picking Faithfully. up a million dollars a night, yeah. singing a few old songs, yeah. getting blown, you know, <laughs> In the dressing room I'm gonna after write, the show. And Perry said, I'm going to write a song about that experience. And it's called, it, and it's called Faithfully. Because it's lonely on the yeah, road. Yeah, it's lonely. Being apart ain't easy on this love affair. Two strangers learn to fall in love again. That's right. I, mean, I there, learn there the are. joy of rediscovering you. Old girl, you stand by me. <laughs> I'm forever yours. Faithfully. Charisse. Copyright, Mr. Steve Perry. Now look, Charisse, look here, Charisse, Pamela Anderson, Chardonnay, yeah. <laughs> Brittany, and Beaujolais. I want you out of my room now. Yeah, because I'm I am faithfully. faithfully. Anyway, so the the band start playing the umpteenth cover. I mean, Faithfully was a massive hit in America. It's a huge, huge journey hit. Covered by bar bands everywhere because, like a lot of Perry's songs, they're singers' songs. You know, they they're like, if you've got the chops, you want to sing a Steve Perry song because you can show show off how good you are. And also, sorry, just to interject. Yeah, no, here. no, please do. Um, <laughs> please do. It's not as if I'm telling a story or anything. Just feel oh, free. Well, yeah. Well, I yeah. I learned at the feet of the master, yeah, obviously. Yeah, the voice of the why, master. Why let a good story come to its conclusion when you can just butt in <laughs> with something completely fucking different and irrelevant? Um, <laughs> Bitterness. Steve Perry, Steve Perry is a blue-eyed soul singer. Yes. Because he was in Journey, they go, oh, rock singer. No. Yeah. No, 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 no. He's when great. Steve, when Steve, he famously drives a VW Beetle, okay? He even has that flower still in it. And um, <laughs> what's he listening to in his Beetle as he drives around L.A.? Yeah. It, ain't, it ain't Ronnie James Dio. No, it's not. No, he's, his great hero is Sam Cooke. He's listening Sam, to Sam yeah. Cooke. He's listening to the Reverend Al Green. Yeah, yeah. So all of those kind of very sort of mellifluous voices, great, great, classic voices, that was Perry. And, and, he, and it influences writing a lot as well, but you had this kind of great counterpoint of, of Neil Sean and also Jonathan Cain who would temper that with a kind of rock sensibility. So you've got this very unique thing. Well, We're not here well, to talk about... Rock, rock in inverted commas. In, because, yeah, because exactly. Sean, AOR, Sean, it's AOR. Sean coming AOR. from Santana. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And Cain well, being a Beatles nut. Yeah, yeah. Have you but, heard of the Beatles, John? I don't talk very about good, them. Very I good. I don't discuss them. From which I do everything else comes. Them. Everything comes. So, including Journey. So, Most Sean, especially Sean Journey. now at this point, Sean's it's it's five thirty a.m. in San Francisco. You know, one eye's pointing to the left, one eye's pointing to the right. He hits play on this video, and they start the umpteenth cover version of Faithfully that he's listened to. Faithfully starts, "How we run into the midnight sun, wheels go round and round." Doing coke off your bum. <laughs> that one. In my mind. So, right. And I'm doing a Bugger line. me. Bugger <laughs> me. This little Filipino guy starts singing it. And you would think it was Steve Perry. It was utterly sensational. There's a bit at the end of... There's a sort of... We're talking about the singer's bit. There's a bit at the end of Faithfully where Perry hits this immense high note at the end of the song. And bear in mind, this is a restaurant in downtown Manila, probably. So no one's watching. There's people just having their dinner. No one's watching. No one's really listening. And this guy on stage, and he bangs out this high note at the end of Faithfully. So they then show Sean, that he's, the next minute, is writing him an email. And he's going, dear, Anna, I don't know if this is going to reach you. This is not a hoax. I am Neil Sean. Would you like to sing with The Real Journey? <laughs> So they then cut to this scene, and it's a classic. It, it's it's so good. It's like Christopher Guest has filmed it for Spinal Tap. They cut to Arnel Panida now, who's gone back to his school in the Philippines, and he's meeting with his old teacher. And the you know the cameras are on them. There's this big kind of reunion, and the teacher comes up to him and she goes, uh, "So, uh, what was your name then?" He goes. Uh, Arnell, Arnell, and she doesn't even remember him. She doesn't remember him, but around them are kids and, every, you know, going crazy. And he's back, and he's back, you know, as the centre of journey. Goes back to the huge star. They then tell you the story in between those two points, 
very nicely done. And what happens is he's flown over to America by Sean. He's put in a studio, but because he's got jet lag, he sings terribly on the first attempt. They've actually got film of him singing on his first attempt. Jonathan Cain's sitting there, Ross Valerie's sitting there, all of this stuff. Sings terribly, comes back the next day, he's very slightly better. Comes back the day after that, they're going, this guy is the singer in Journey. He's, he's in town. They then cut to him on stage. They show him singing on stage. And my God, he is just a phenomenal singer. Can't tell you how good this bloke is. Well, this is all very well, John. Yes. But this isn't the Arnell podcast, is it? We're talking about Journey. We are. So we are. shall we talk about Journey? Yes, but I find it I just find it <laughs> fascinating that they had they had to sort of replace the irreplaceable. And this guy's had this long career where he's obviously a phenomenal singer. Again on YouTube, there are all these videos of um uh singing teachers. They do these what they call reaction clips where you're a a, a singing teacher, they they play them a video of someone singing, they sort of analyse it. Uh-huh. They, there's rows and rows of these Arnel Panida things where they're listening to him sing Journey songs and they're just going, I can't believe this guy's real. What mm. he's doing yeah. from a technical singer's point of view yeah. is Do you remember just before we pressed record, you said, let's yeah. not talk about yeah, the anyway, music. Yeah, anyway, so I've talked about the music. That's and, it. And, and that's why it. we've just spent half an hour talking about a fucking guy that never had a hit with Journey. Exactly. That's the amazing thing. He's never had a hit. He's never, no one Can we knows. talk about the guys that did have We will, hits? we will. Because then people I just, will know who we're talking but, but about. I just I find it weird that like he's this and it goes back to the point about him being at the school and his teacher not even knowing what his name was and yet he's the singer in journey and he's and he's mass he's a massive star but he's irrelevant he's irrelevant to the band's mm. history mm. he's irrelevant to the to he's not famous but he is famous he's playing to sold out shows every night as you said you went to see them yeah and what how many tickets do they sell every night they did two nights at the la forum yeah it was when they were touring with def leppard in 2018 and i totted up um ticket sales on that tour they did like 60 shows and uh, it was over $100 million. You know? Yeah. But now listen, I hear what you're saying, and, and but I feel we're going incre- off, we're completely off message. We at are, this point. we are. Because yeah. what the fuck has Arnell got to do with all the hits that Journey had? Nothing. 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 So Apart from the fact he can sing them amazingly well, yeah. Not only have we talked about him in a previous pod, we're now talking about him again. Yeah. Back to Journey. Yeah. Journey were really Journey up until, I think, Raised on Radio. How about that? That is because such suddenly, a... I mean, Steve Smith has gone. He's not in the group at that point, is he? Russ Valerie's not in the group. Um, Jonathan Kane is. Of course, he is. But he wasn't an original. Greg Rowley was the original keyboardist. He was. But but Journey only really started to happen when Jonathan Kane turned up. Yeah. Well, they 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 certainly became mega, and you can't underestimate Kane's role in that because. He co-authored some of those, what they now call the Dirty Dozen, the yeah. biggest hits. But before Kane joined, they did do some tremendous songs. I I worked with them briefly in 79. Yeah. I can't remember what that album was, Eclipse or something. And um, they had that track on it, Lights. Yeah. Now that for me is when just one of my lights go down in the city, in the city, and the moon, moon shines on, on the bay. The bay, yeah. another amazing piece of Perry singing. Oh no, absolutely! Yeah. But to me, that was—I mean, I think it's even Ainsley Dunbar on drums. I think on it probably track. is. Yeah, Greg Rowley on keyboards. Uh, really, it's that original what they used to call a jam band. Yeah, instrumental, pyrotechnical. I mean, a bit like. Um, you know, like say with Kansas, "Carry On My Wayward yeah. Son," but but or Toto. You know, you'd have the the melody, but really you'd have this huge sort of architecture yes, around it. Yes, yes. That was Journey, but without the singer or the melody. Greg Rowley used to do vocals. Yeah. They bring this guy in, Steve Perry. They're about to lose their deal. It, we're in the realm of now well, art the, for the, art's the, sake. Hit singles for fuck's exactly. sake. This is the Her, the Herbie Herbert, their fa- the, you know, their manager famous character basically strong arms perry onto them so yeah. look you have to have this guy and cbs are about to drop you so you better have a hit with this guy that was basically what happened and yet it worked yeah i mean the, the tour they did in the uk in i, I want to say summer probably spring of 79 
was one of the first I worked on as a proper PR. And they were touring with Pat Travers was opening. It wasn't a co-headline, but there was a suggestion because they couldn't sell tickets on their own. Pat couldn't sell tickets on his own, so they comboed. And we went round the country, like five shows, and, and of those five shows, four of them, maybe two-thirds sold out. Nice, but... And then they did London, and it was full of all these Americans yeah. that couldn't believe Journey yeah, were actually yeah, playing yeah. the Hammersmith Odeon. Um, and that was amazing because you suddenly got it. You could see uh, how Americans related. Yes, they're, they're one of those bands who you kind of have all to... All American bands. Yeah, I was going to say, you have to go to America to understand why they're big. You really do because yeah. you hear it on the radio, yeah. like driving down the coast road in California. Yeah, yeah you, you get and you it. Hear, you get it. don't but, stop but, believing. But yeah, but it's not, and it's not even just that. It's You can hear it in the middle of... You know the the flyover states, as they say. Yeah. Um, you can hear it there, and you understand it. It's the small town American experience. It's the lyrics to "Don't Stop Believing." That that's that is the small town American experience, and uh, they In captured fact, that very well. When, when they used to do it live, um, Steve would always change the name of the town to whatever yeah, town they yeah, were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the line? Uh, Detroit or something? Yeah. What. Well, uh, born and raised in South Detroit. That's it. Yeah. And he would change yeah. it to born and raised in yeah. Southampton. Yeah. <laughs> what a, but yeah. South but, Boise, but, but Idaho. Here's, here's the thing, and here's the thing I really want to get into. South is, Melbourne. Is, you know, Journey then become, for a brief period, the biggest band in America. Mm. They're huge. And this is where it all starts to fall apart. And I think that in many, many ways, they are a classic cautionary tale. Because it all starts to fall apart. And you look at them now, and th as a group of people, they're incredibly interesting. And I must say, incredibly strange. Mm. They've got, you know, Perry, who ups and disappears, and I'll talk about that in a minute, going off and finding him. You've got um, Jonathan Kane, who is now, now amazingly married to the woman who was Donald Trump's spiritual advisor. Yeah. You know, a, a kind of evangelical Christian who does laying on of hands all and and, Kane, and, and, and and saying to people on the television, uh, you need to send me a check. Send me your check. And Kane turns up at her. If, if you go on YouTube again and look for her, you'll see Kane in the background playing the piano on stage while she's sermonizing. And it was her got, that took yeah. Kane to meet Donald Trump yeah, in to the meet, White House. Exactly. So you've got that going on. Kane and you, Kid you, Rock. Exactly. You've got, <laughs> you've got Kane's doing that. You've got Sean, who's an incredibly wild, mad character, you know, and it is known for his eccentricities. And I'm sure you might be able to speak a little bit about well, that. Well, don't forget, this guy was 15 years yeah. old when he joined Santana. Yeah. So these had Just after they've done life. Woodstock. Yeah. Where they're this all is, taking acid yeah. before they go on stage. Yeah. Fifteen. Yeah, this is his. So he's had a whole lifetime of this madness, and he's also been in the band with Sammy Hagar, and he's done all this other stuff as well. Paul Rogers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, amazing character, and 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 it's just this weird, strange, cautionary tale. Mm. And Perry, I mean, does raised on radio, basically disappears off the face of the earth. You know, which is an amazing thing. Well, at that a... point, he'd had sort of five years of being a ma the major rock yeah. star in America. Yeah. But he wasn't like a Coverdale or David Lee Roth. He 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 wasn't known for his dynamite stage show. He was known for his incredible singing voice. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, and 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 that in itself, I think, brings a different kind of pressure. Because obviously in, in rock, we're blessed, have been blessed with some tremendous singers. But, you know, Ronnie James Dio was a tremendous singer, but he had a stage act, you know, the, the horns yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that yeah. stuff, the, the frock sleeves. You know, I mean, Coverdale had his whole kind of cock rock thing going on. Great singer, but very much, you know, created his own image. Um, Steve Perry comes along and he might just be a better singer than any of them. But he doesn't project in that sense. No, it's all no. about... He's like bloody Marvin Gaye. Well, no, Marvin Gaye was a showman, but he's like Smokey Robinson or something. He literally just stands there and emotes. Uh, and that was enough yeah, that was it, MTV. Was, it was. So Perry kind of disappears. He comes back with a... In all the early 2000s, I want to say, with a tremendous solo album called For the Love of Strange Medicine, 
which is this beautiful studio creation. You know, it sounds like it's had billions of dollars spent on it. Probably had. Probably had, yeah. But the timing's wrong because it's grunge and all of that. And that then for him, that's it. He's he's gone. He's vi- vanished into well, the ether. Well, you're talking about and, strange people. I mean, Steve, it's now known, uh, had an alcohol problem, went into rehab. Um, apparently he woke up one morning at home, literally in a pool of red wine. Yeah. And apparently, I don't, I'm don't. i only telling you what I've heard, um, he left that huge stain on the carpet for years as a reminder My, yeah. for how yeah. low you can go. Yeah. And he was. He was gone forever. He wasn't coming back. John Bon Jovi told me in about 1990, Blaze of Glory, that era, when Bon Jovi are shaky and John Solo... He said Steve Perry had contacted him uh, to say, you know, um, don't give it up so easily because it never comes again. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I'm not saying that was the only contributing factor, but sure enough, Bon Jovi do come back. There's a lot see, to be see, said for not yeah, breaking the magic uh, formula. Exactly. And here's the odd thing that happens. Um, Journey... Uh, I, I would equate them weirdly to a band like Dire Straits in that they were so associated with a particular place and time yeah. that they became trapped by it. And now Dire, and Dire Straits are the same kind of joke. You know, they're a kind of, there's a sort of kind of joke stuff attached to them. You know, old Dire Straits, old Journey. They had that thing going on. And then this very weird thing happens in that the songs take on a life of their own and Don't Stop Believing in particular is adopted. First of all, it becomes the song that closes The Sopranos, the great American TV drama that sort of establishes TV as this new medium. Final episode, what's going to, you know, Tony Soprano is about to encounter whatever fate it is you believe he encounters. But it just before that happens, he puts a song on the jukebox. And it's Don't Stop and Believing. And it's Don't Stop Believing. Yeah. And then that song is taken up by Glee, this mm. new TV. It has another life as, as, a, as a... So all of a sudden these songs are kind of reactivated. And about that time, I think, um, uh, Classic Rock did a spin-off about AOR. And Jeff Barton said to me, do you reckon you could get hold of Steve Perry? Which was, <laughs> I mean, you might as well have said, do you reckon you can get hold of... I don't know. But uh, uh, to be... Uh, because I'm, I wasn't at that point and I'm not now day-to-day involved in music, it didn't bother me in a way it would have once have done. If you'd said to me, like, back in the day, can you go and find I would have been like, oh, my God, it's like going to find, <laughs> you know... Uh, Axel. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It was like it would have been too big, but I just thought, uh, you know... So uh, there was a kind of... He had a internet following, a fan following, and he contacted them. Through them, I got a number for his lawyer. He was this kind of big shot San Francisco guy. Same guy. I yeah. contacted him myself okay. last year. Oh, okay. Well, then, you know what he's... I mean, he, he's just like, you know, he's not... A, it's not like phoning up, you know, no. Rod Smallwood or something. This is guy's just a no-bullshit, big-money international lawyer, you know, doesn't really care whether it's music or whatever the product is. He's a lawyer, you know, he's there to me. Get in touch with him. He gets a message to Perry. Perry agrees to do an interview, which I was just astonished by. <laughs> Not only does he agree to do an interview that lasted for about two hours, he then rang me back the following night because he had more to say. And all of a sudden it was like this kind of outpouring. And he just said he hadn't done the interviews because no one had asked him. And he just had this kind of outpouring. And he, I still think he's one of the most interesting and misunderstood rock stars I've spoken to. And as you say, he's had the alcohol problem, the drug problem, all of that stuff. He just at that time had been in a relationship with a a woman who died of cancer. He'd lost her. He was pretty much on his own. And she made him the famous promise. She made him make her a promise. Yeah. Which was that he wouldn't uh, throw away the rest of his days not singing yeah. and not making music. But, but I think and that was the precursor to Journey getting back together in the mid-90s. Was it Trial by Fire? Trial by Fire, Fire. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. Kevin Shirley but, produced. Kevin Shirley produced. But I think Perry, had, the other thing that happened to him was he'd had this complete collapsing confidence mm. and he he was... It was on, it was almost sad on the phone. He, he'd written these songs, which eventually became the solo album he released... Couple a of years couple ago. of years ago, he written these songs. And he go, but but no, you know, I don't think anyone, no one wants to hear from me today. No one wants to hear, 
you know, anything I've done. And he, he wasn't saying that out of false modesty. He genuinely believed it. People don't realise how so many of these rock stars have been out of the spotlight for years and years, just how nervous and insecure yeah, ins- they are about will I be insecure. allowed back in the and door. The only thing that got him back was a few months after this interview had happened, he very strange, and we'd had a conversation about this when it were, he he was a big fan of the band The Eels. I don't oh, know yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. Eels with Mr. Up, Mark Everett. He? Yeah, he did. Well, Mark Everett actually invited him to a show, and Perry was in love with it. There's there's one he really likes the Eels or a lot of this. There's one song called In the Yard Behind the Church. Which is, it's a really beautiful song of the way Mr. E from the Eels can do sometimes. Perry loved this song, and he sang it on stage. With the with the eels and uh, it kind of brought him back a little bit in front of him. and he went I think there is again on YouTube there's a clip of him when he first appears with the eels and it's really heartwarming because the crowd go nuts and you wouldn't think that a kind of a, a, a an audience that liked the eels would go nuts for Steve Perry but by this point those kind of cultural factors of the Sopranos and Glee and all of that had kicked in and he the journey had become this beloved American thing well. That song is now the most downloaded song of the 21st century. Yeah, I can believe it, yeah. Um, uh, But I think what you're saying, it's all incredibly interesting. But for me, it kind of comes down to it's the Robert Plant, Led Zeppelin thing. It's why wouldn't they get back together? And, 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 And it isn't because of music. It is because they're all in their strange... Bubbles. I think it is. I think also Perry feels incredibly... I mean, he's a bit like Jimmy Page in that regard. He feels incredibly close to the material. I mean, these songs mean everything to him, which is why it ripped his heart out when Journey were a bit of a joke and he felt everyone thought he was a joke. Because... Whatever you say about the songs, they're his heart and soul. You and know. he wrote most of them with Jonathan. He did, I yeah, mean, yeah. with Neil as well. But, I mean, Don't Stop Believing has a Neil credit... Um, yeah, I think Sean had written the middle section first, hadn't he? And they put the other stuff around it. Could be, yeah. I think that's but I've got an happened. interesting one for you here. This is what Neil Sean told me. Uh, Don't Stop Believing began that, you know, dun 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 the yeah, piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said uh, Jonathan Cain was at the piano playing Let It Be by the Beatles. Right, right. Which goes dun 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 uh, and, and from Let It Be by The Beatles came Don't Stop Believing, Look Back in Anger by Oasis. And Neil told me that he played the bass on that track as well because right. if you listen to Don't Stop Believing, it's really got that warm... Yeah, it has, very warm bass full, sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ong, yeah. Ong, ong, ong. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, Neil definitely got a deserved credit on that one. But some of the other big hits they had, it was basically Steve and Jonathan. Yeah, Cain. yeah, they did. I mean, all of those ones were sort of semi love but like Open Arms, Faithfully, the big piano ballads. And, with and all isn't those it interesting? Two. Open Arms, Faithfully. Steve is a very spiritual person. Yeah, he's very he's sincere in the way that there's no artifice. Uh, he's being. Comp- I mean, we were joking about Faithfully. He is being completely sincere in that song. He is incredibly sincere, very heartfelt. I say spiritual. I mean, when you go into any kind of AA or any kind of rehab program, they ask you to believe in a higher power. Jonathan Cain, you know, in the last few years, particularly after he hooked up with Paula, what's her name? Paula White, is it? Yeah, I think um, it is. Is now a born again Christian. Yeah. But he looks like a guy. <laughs> really, he looks like he's about to go on stage as a magician's helper in <laughs> Vegas, isn't he? He's got like a sort of fancy jacket and he's got big sideburns yeah. and weird quaffed hair. He looks, sort of looks like David Copperfield's mate or something, you know. Yeah. He, he, very, he, looks, very he, strange. Looks, he looks strange, yeah. yeah. Neil, as you say, a wild man. I mean, Neil, Eric Clapton asked Neil to join Derek and the Dominoes when yeah. Neil was like 15. <laughs> And Derek and Domino's are this is bunch of junkies. Yeah, that, yeah. And here come, yeah. Neil's living at home with mum and dad. Yeah. And uh, and he's like, oh, I don't know, because they were like, you've got to come to England and live with me at yeah. my house. Yeah, it's Eric take, Clapton take when he was Eric Clapton. Heroin. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, oh, maybe not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll just go with That's Carlos amazing. Santana and just take yeah. shitloads of acid. Yeah. yeah. Do you um, want the heroin? Do you want the acid? It's your choice. <laughs> hey, it's the 60s. Let's have it all. 15 year old kid. 
But with Neil, also, by the time you get to Journey being mega, you know, the 80s, early 90s, whatever, he is a serious booze hound, yep. Krell, the whole menagerie. And finally, and he's been married like five times <laughs> or something, finally he gets clean. So the Neil I got to know three years ago when I was talking to him about maybe working with him on his memoir, mm. um, that guy was super clean, uh, current wife, my Keller, really nice woman, and constant companions. Yeah. But on the road with Journey at that point, they weren't just split into two camps. There was the, there was the Jonathan Kane camp, which was Paula, Jonathan... Trump is God, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Um, stop the steal, you know. Uh, and then on this side, you've got Neil uh, and Mike Keller uh, and probably Arnell. Arnell's easygoing. But R Russ Valerie, Ross Valerie, Ross, yeah. and uh, Steve Smith were, were, you know, they were just super cool, but not really our game. You know, this yeah. isn't really. Yeah. We've got no skin in this yeah. game, we, really. We just play 12 songs a night. They call it the Dirty Dozen. Yeah. But... Um, Which are mostly the Perry Kane compositions, actually. But they had their and own dressing ways. rooms and Neil had a, an armed security officer guarding his door every <laughs> night he was on stage. So the levels of... Paranoia. Yeah, which must go back decades yeah, and decades yeah, yeah. and decades. Whatever's going on, they definitely... It was not what you call a happy backstage... It was immensely tense. But I remember talking to Neil and, and you yeah, know, the obvious questions. Could, could could you ever see Steve coming back? And and it became clear to me that Neil has nothing but big love for Steve Perry. I think Jonathan Caney seems as a, sees as a bit of a write-off because Jonathan just seemed almost like a basket case. Yeah. He didn't seem to be of this earth. It was really like Paula had him on a lead yeah. walking around. Yeah. Um, but Steve, for sure, except, and they're both clean. They both. They are, well, I, I, yeah, I think this. I think that's really interesting. I think there's probably two things there. One is Perry is now in his sixties, and you know time takes its toll. Pineda's a lot younger, and is he a lot younger? He's well, probably about think, fifty now, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, maybe he is. But, be, yeah. but I mean, he's not had the wear and tear that Perry's had, you know. And whether Steve's voice can still do night after night of those twelve songs. Because Probably Perry's, not. here's the thing, Perry's a perfectionist. And part of the reason he won't go out there is because it won't be perfect. That's his thing. But you, you know, know what, John? As Lemmy once said to me when talking about his hair, we have the technology. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it, yeah they do. They do. And that's true. And but whether, all bands but, use yeah, it. Now. But whether, all Perry, bands. whether Perry would accept that, I don't know. I mean, it's just thinking about that. Yeah, here's, here's an example of what Perry's like. He's essentially down on his knees with. Um, feeling that Journey has been completely overlooked by rock history. He gets the phone call from David Chase, the guy who does The Sopranos, saying, I want to use Don't Stop Believing yeah. at the end of The Sopranos. The one show that all of America <laughs> is waiting to watch, right? And anyone, anyone at that point would have just bitten his hand off and mm. gone, here's my ticket to, you know. But not my Steve. Perry's like, no. I want to know. I want to know what's going to happen to the character because I don't want my song associated with some sort of bloodbath. I want to know. I want to see the script, so I'm not being not having the piss taken out of my song. You know, he was he was like that. And Chase apparently, I mean, Perry said that Chase said Perry ended up being one of I think of like three people who knew what the ending was going to be. Really? Yeah. Yeah, and at, at least but, with Steve Perry, gives, though, you know he's not exactly going to be no, out he's there not going to black broadcast it. But I mean, yeah, that just shows you. Yeah, anyone, anyone else, and um, I mean, presumably Kane and Sean had given their permission without even thinking about it. You know, Perry was not willing to do that, and I think if you project that forward, I think going on the road and singing with Janet, I think one part of him would love it because he'd love the adulation and the respect he gets from the crowd. But I think unless he could be perfect, he wouldn't do it. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that. I think there's you, also yeah, you a lot tell, of personal I mean, I know, betrayal. Yeah, and, I know you're alluding to the playing of tapes as well, which, as you say, all bands do. But again, if you think about Perry and his heroes and who he is, it's so anti what he would want. I, so I agree. I, I just think that it. the technology is such now that it's not even tapes. Mm. I mean, Ian Jeffrey, we must do an episode on 
amazing tour managers mm. one time because they really are. Yeah, they know oh, where they, all the bodies... They, yeah, in fact, they help bury most yeah, of the bodies. Yeah. Uh, Ian started out as a tour manager working for ACDC, Bon Scott era, before they were huge. Uh, in fact, the, the two young brothers would share a hotel room, bassist and drummer share a hotel room, and Ian had to share a hotel room with Bon. <laughs> He said we used to. Yeah. He said we used to take all the beds out of the hotel rooms before we got there because we knew we wouldn't be going to sleep yeah. with Bon. He went from that to in the eighties. He was he became tour manager for Ozzy, Def Leppard when they were the biggest band on the planet, Metallica when they were the biggest band on the planet. He's done Lady Gaga now. Blah blah blah. The most recent huge gig he did was U two, and he said to me. Um, the difference between when I started out as a tour manager, he said, with ACDC, Bon, pretty much every show in America was opening for somebody else in those days. No technology at all. He said, you literally had to start from the bottom every night and work that room, terrible sound, good sound, yeah, the yeah. whole thing. And that carried on for decades. And he said, these days, my job... He goes, with you too. He goes, everybody's ready. We synchronise. We hit the exact moment. We press a button on a computer. That's it. Yeah. And everything else triggers and fires from that. And Neil Sean himself said to me, we were talking about this, and he said, even even the... I said, no, I said, oh, everybody uses it now, don't they? Particularly the... Because we're talking about Def Leppard. They have massive technology, yeah. you can imagine. And um, I said, I guess only people like the Eagles don't use that. And he went, no, even the Eagles. Yeah. I went, even the Eagles? Yeah. He went, of course. Well, they would, he yeah. said, because if, if everybody's doing it and you don't, people think you're no good anymore. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that, yes, it would go against everything Steve believes up to a point in history, but now it's part of the deal in the same way that you have an electric microphone or you have electric yeah, instruments. Yeah. But then you add it, then I suppose you add that to the personal stuff that's gone on. That I think Jay. is the key. Yeah. I think that's the key. And I think he, I mean, I can think of people, mutual friends of ours that I wouldn't work with again. But I can, I mean, some people do sometimes come to me and say, oh, it's a shame, you know, yeah, you yeah. Don't do this or that. And I'm like, it is, but I, I just couldn't bear it. Yeah. Once would be enough. Can you imagine doing seven, eight months of that? Yeah, yeah. That's the difficult... I mean, you think of this sheer... As you say, the sheer madness that surrounds a band like Journey and then throw Perry into the mix as well. Is You know, is it going to last... Are you better off with Arnell, who's not going to say boo to a goose? Is oh. producing these tremendous vocal performances, and actually, you know what? From a distance, he looks enough like Steve Perry that if you if you're in the gig and you kind of squint, and you might as well be watching Journey. And Arnell is able to. He can't. He isn't Steve Perry, so he's never written those songs, and he mm. never will. But he he completes the picture in a way that Steve can't either, because yeah. Arnell is a real crowd pleaser. He goes out there. And I, I, I watched them and he I just was amazed by him because the rest of them are still very much in the stand here and play club. Yeah. Arnell goes out there and completely projects. He absolutely spends the whole show working his ass off with the audience. And I I never saw Steve Perry do that. I mean, he he didn't have yeah. to. Yeah. But Arnell does, and he does a really, really good job of it. And it becomes a wonderful night. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. I think that's really you know, as say he's in this, and that's kind of what I was talking about at the start, he's in this very weird position where he's no one, but everything's dependent on him. And it's kind of odd to be like that. Would it work with other bands, though? Say, what? for instance, Jimmy Page was on YouTube one night looking at Led Zeppelin tribute yeah. bands, of, of which, which there, there are, are loads. millions. Yeah, yeah. And, you've... and he finds a Robert Plant, of yeah. which there are many. yeah. Maybe not. I don't know. It's that weird thing of, and again, it goes to that, you know, it's that thing about the singing teachers watching the videos and this spell that Pineda casts on them. And it's partly because Perry is also revered. Um, but what's interesting about those people doing that, and I know you're laughing because it's on YouTube and you kind of waste your life looking at this stuff, but 
because some of the some of the singing teachers are younger and they've never heard these people. And there's some great ones of like there's a girl seeing Ronnie Dio for the first <laughs> time and going, you know, what, he's doing Children of the Sea, right? And she's going as a pure, she's reacting as a pure singing teacher, saying this guy is unbelievable. <laughs> the note he's hitting there is so high and so pure and so good. And we kind of forget about all of this. She does Robin Zander when he's singing The Flame, which is another song Arnel Pineda does a cover of on YouTube. And going, Zander, what a singer. And you suddenly see it through new eyes. You go, Jesus, that is an incredible performance that guy's putting in, you know. Why, why do you think then Steve Perry doesn't do solo shows? Yeah, again, I think, I think he's so hypercritical of himself. And I think he probably knows that maybe the voice that he had once isn't the voice he's got now. Because that's where the money is now. You know, and I know he put up the solo album in 2018. I thought it was a good record, but... Yeah. But Perry doesn't need the money, does he? I mean, you imagine... The, what, what is it do, the most they down- all need well, they the do, money they do and they don't what you're saying it's the most downloaded song of all time don't is, stop believing don't stop believing he's got don't stop believing he's got you know well faithfully he's open got the dirty arms dozen and the other of the dirty dozen I mean he, he's not hurting for cash Steve Perry he isn't but he's not my, he's not kind of multi-divorced as, like as, Neil Sharp as my former accountant the late great Frank Dunphy once said to me hello Mick there now have a cigar that's when I first met him. He, um, he, in a later life, became the business manager for Damien Hurst. <laughs> yeah. And, he, and it was Frank that came up with the idea of, of, of uh, you know, he kept saying, why do they have these auctions of artists that are dead? Why don't they have them while they're alive? And Damien went, I don't know. He said, well, let's do one. Yeah. And they got like 100 million in a day. <laughs> yeah. um, Frank said to me... Uh, I was involved in a project with Sharon Osbourne 30 odd years ago and it went south mm. and it went south in my opinion because she would make she would have she'd be able to get someone else to do the job for less money and I said to Frank what is what does that mean to her what's an extra 100,000 to her you know and he goes Mick they've never Got enough money. No, yeah, look, that's there's absolutely... no such thing as enough there's no, money. There's not. There's not. So I don't think it's money. With I don't think Steve's going. I don't need the money. If he doesn't need the money, fine, go out and sing. You know, no, but no. he doesn't want to go out and sing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think you're right. But I think it's all of those factors. It's his perfectionism. It's probably the state of what his voice would be like. It's probably a bit he doesn't want to be with the other Journey guys. You know, it's probably... Well, a, then why not those. just do a I mean, solo but, show? Yeah, but the guy was paralysed with, you know, mm. self-doubt. Yeah. What, no more than five or six years ago. Yeah. Paralysed with self-doubt. Yeah. So what, where would where would he now suddenly be? No, I, the guy, I, you know. Well, I, I'm asking because I was hoping no. to get a, 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 an insight, and you've given it because he is, and I think remains an extraordinary singer. Yeah. You, you might lose your upper register. You might have to re make adjustments. But the fact is, that oh, he man would, was he born, would still, born. He would still sing amazingly, and all they would do is just take those songs down a step, and he would sing them. He would sing them brilliantly. You know that. I know that. But you can't tell him that. It's not what he wants, you know. Steve, if yeah. you're listening... If you're listening, do it, Steve. It will please be, sing. I mean, I mean it's will... just... You know, it's, it's that sort of... You know, it's like Michael Jordan or someone. It's like, yeah, he wasn't his best at the end of the Chicago Bulls or whatever it was, but 60% of Michael Jordan was, was a, better than 100% of a, a lot of other people, you know, yeah. and a lot of other really good people. A fantastic singer, a gifted musician... And I always loved Journey. I liked them before Steve joined, but after he joined, he became that, that he, they were the grit in the oyster. He was the pearl. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Are we done? Have we come to the end of our journey? Oh. Any more to add? Maybe we have. Maybe we have. Don't stop believing. <laughs> If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave us a review, share it with a friend, or plain old subscribe wherever you listen to it. To get you some conversation online, follow us on Twitter at GetcherPod. Until next time. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.